and a warm welcome to this session of the 2022 ET Auto EV Conclave. This uh, panel discussion is on the theme of charging, swapping, and powering ahead. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this uh, session, which I'm sure will be very interesting and enriching. And uh, it's also my pleasure and uh, privilege to uh, introduce uh, our esteemed panelists, uh, starting with uh, uh, Mrs. Sula Jafiro the Motwani, founder and CEO, Kinetic Green, uh, Mr. Pulkit Kurana, co-founder, Battery Smart, Mr. Anil Giri Raju, co-founder and COO, Bounce Infinity, Mr. Jyotiranjan Harichandran, co-founder, Bolt, and last but not the least, Mr. Arun Shreyas Reddy, founder, Race Energy. So, uh, lady and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for sparing your time and uh, participating in this panel discussion. Uh, over the next 45 minutes or so, we are going to have, a, I'm sure, a very interesting and fruitful discussion around the theme of charging and swapping and powering ahead, uh, which in, uh, in India, as we all know, there is, uh, in, for the matter, in the automotive industry, uh, in this uh, innovative and disruptive age, there is uh, no one single silver bullet to uh, address any challenge. There are multiple ways, especially with all the technology developments that are taking shape, and most of them are being uh, led by startups and uh, some of who are present in this panel discussion. Uh, but uh, to start off with, let me get the OEM perspective on this whole uh, kind of uh, solutions of powering EVs. You know? And uh, the uh, Kinetic uh, is a brand which is, you know, it doesn't need any introduction in India. And in this new age, it's really reinventing itself. In fact, it has started, it has already re re reinvented uh, in the EV space with uh, the, in the three wheeler segment. And recently, it has also made a foray into the two wheeler space. So let's get uh, Kinetics, uh, the OEM's perspective from Sulaja. Sulaja, tell us, I mean, as you have, you have had a, you know, a few years of good presence in the uh, three wheeler segment, you have just forayed into the uh, two wheeler segment as, as well. How do you see this? Uh, the, uh, the, the, how do we address the uh, uh, challenge of getting the right uh, fit or right option for the right segment in terms of powering these EVs? So um, uh, good morning and uh, very happy to be here on this panel and hello to all my co-panelists. Um, it's a very interesting uh, topic that we have chosen for this panel and I think the timing is very good as well. Um, I firmly believe, you know, we have been one of the pioneering companies in the EV sector Today, of course, it's very fashionable to be an EV startup, but five, six years ago, when we started, we were one of the very early players. There was no government policy, which was clearly laid out. There was no supply chain to speak of. There was very little by way of charging or any other ecosystem. Um, there was very little demand and awareness amongst customers. They had more doubts than acceptance uh, for EV as a technology. So uh, we have come a long way since then, um, but Kinetic Green worked uh, at the ground level on all these areas, whether it was government policy or um, uh, you know, creating awareness, uh, setting up a local supply chain, so on and so forth. So I think what I'm trying to say here is that now, in fact, the sector has made a lot of progress in the last five years, where many good products are available to the customers. More and more good products are going to be available to the customers. Customer attitude towards EV has turned positive from a push sale as an OEM, where we had to look for customers and create programs, you know, welfare schemes and government programs to deploy our vehicles. We are now seeing that the showrooms of EV companies like Kinetic are full of customers. Uh, there is more demand uh, than supply, in fact, in the electric two wheelers today. And I only imagine that the tide is turning towards EVs. Um, in India, people speak about only three things when they meet. It's either films or cricket or automobiles. And now when they speak about automobiles, EV is definitely part of the chat. And people are seriously considering electric vehicles as a purchasing option. So I believe that the tide is turning towards EVs where we are at an inflection point. And certainly when it comes to light mobility, which is two wheelers and three wheelers, uh, because of the price parity brought about by fame, I think there is serious interest from customers in buying electric vehicles. So this is the right time that the industry players should sit down together 
and work together to create the EV ecosystem by way of charging and, and uh, battery solutions. Uh, because uh, finally customers are going to uh, require convenience. They're going to need the confidence that they can charge their EVs conveniently. And there are many different problems which need to be addressed. So I firmly believe that time has come for OEMs and charging and swapping providers to collaborate and find the solutions. I also believe that um, it's a time for collaboration and not for you know having closed systems or proprietary kind of uh, solution thought process. This sector is evolving through collaboration. It's going to be a disruptive sector with great opportunity for everybody. Uh, so I think the more companies work together and uh, co-create, share, um, I think is going to provide a, a faster impetus to EV, uh, you know, electrification of the transport sector. So I think we will all benefit by working together. And last point I want to make is that there are solutions which are different uh, different solutions for different segments. It's not one solution fits all. Absolutely. And I think, uh, for example, for light mobility, two wheelers and three wheelers, uh, I firmly believe that battery swapping could emerge as a very a good solution for the next five to seven years, uh, where customers uh, can uh, mirror you know, the EV usage pattern to a rice vehicle pattern. And the price parity will be even more pronounced if the vehicles are sold without batteries. So when we're looking at a fame uh, regime coming to an end in the next couple of years, I think finding a way to have batteries sold separately on a paper use basis uh, and vehicles sold separately, I think would make great uh, commercial case for the customers. So I think battery swapping would be a very good solution for light mobility. The other thing for the light mobility, I think as by way of charging infrastructure is that companies should also look at residential charging infrastructure, not only public because most of the two wheelers will be charged at home and people are struggling, uh, especially those who live in high rises to make charging available, affordable. Uh, so if you can give solutions, you know, where you can collaborate with the builders or whatever it is, uh, you know, ideas come and set up the charging point for the customers. I think that is something that is required. Um, and the last point I would say is that for cars, I think it's a different solution altogether. It's not about swapping. It's going to be something where a lot of innovation on fast charging is is name of the game uh, and public infrastructure will be required uh, highway infrastructure will be required and then we're looking to a new kind of regime with hydrogen fuel and other things coming up but i think i'm very happy to see a lot more startups in this space uh, coming with an innovative solution uh, it's not about scale it's going to be about innovation it's going to be about collaboration and i think if we work together we can definitely together accelerate the EV adoption in the country, especially for electric two and electric three wheelers. So I certainly look forward to ideas from all the other co-panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Solaja. And you uh, rightly said, in this disruptive era, uh, collaboration is uh, the name of the game. It's no longer an exception or uh, exception. It's actually a, a common, or increasingly becoming a common practice. And I won't be surprised if uh, after this EV conclave, some of your, your co-panelists also end up having you know, collaboration with uh, Kinetic Green. Uh, exactly. And uh, that. <laughs> yes, indeed, for mutual benefits and also for the for growing the Indian EV industry, anything that is uh, you know, that contributes to it is more than welcome and uh, worth pursuing. Uh, you touched upon uh, charging. And uh, as you said, uh, nowadays, uh, in almost every conversation, EVs is, is, a, is a topic and no, uh, discussion around EVs is complete without uh, charging infrastructure being uh, no, being talked about. So uh, on that note, let me get in uh, uh, Jyotiranjan uh, Harichandra, who is a co-founder of Bolt. Uh, I mean, I would refer to him as uh, Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti, tell us I mean, uh, about uh, your uh, kind of experience. The, uh, how do you see this space uh, evolving? Uh, I understand you are uh, offering uh, charges, price, as low as uh, 3000 rupees yeah uh, thank you sumatra for basically introducing me and i completely agree with uh, sulaja also here so uh, the uh, thing is uh, 90% 80 to 90% of the charging is rather going to happen at home like she pointed out uh, so the thing is uh, what uh, we are focusing at bolt is to empower people to build charging network for themselves as well as for their communities right uh, so uh, like uh, we have done these partnerships with mygate and park plus where we are installing chargers at apartment places and even the builders are completely 
now uh, refurbishing their new apartments which they are selling with new charging points at each parking lot like this is something which we also didn't anticipate and we are getting a lot of orders from the real estate uh, sector itself and as and when we move forward we will see that a lot of uh, buildings come built in with charging points that will that will be a necessary requirement like how you have a gas pipeline or electricity connection you will have a ev charging point in any of the apartments you or uh, so the houses you are going to buy in the future and if it's not present and you have already bought it uh, you will uh, like the community with itself basically make uh, sure that it's available at least at the visitor parking lot or something like that for uh, consumers to use in fact uh, i'll give you a free uh, few like uh, anecdotal evidences of parking points uh, charging points which we have put in a uh, few societies in uh, bangalore uh, so we have seen that the ev adoption has gone up in those societies where we have put up uh, like common use uh, charging points in their visitor parking lots uh, so uh, in the last 2 3 months uh, essentially after we have installed the a uh, percentage of adoption in those apartments has gone up from 1% to 2 3% essentially uh, so uh, the thing is um, like it's a chicken and egg problem again uh, like whether you build the charging point uh, charging network first or basically the uh, evs will come first uh, we think uh, like we are at the infrastructure place we are putting in a lot more charging points uh, right now and in fact our aim is to put a charging point in every house every office every parking lot empower these people to charge the anywhere their vehicles are parked because if you look at it nine uh, how how big is your uh, uh, charging uh, infra uh, network uh, infrastructure uh, so and how does that what do at what rate do you plan to expand it so currently we have about 10000 odd charging points uh, you can just download our app and you can see uh, it uh, right away in bangalore uh, we have more than uh, 4000 charging points i think uh in every city like pune mumbai uh, delhi uh, hyderabad uh, where we are operational in i think uh, we have added more than 1000 charging points per city uh, at a, we are expanding at a rate of about 250 300 per day currently and um, uh, by the year end we will be putting uh, about a lakh uh, charging points uh, across india um, and in the next couple of years the aim is to put a million charging points that's good to know and uh, and pretty sure if the initial uh, experience uh, of the impact it's having in those uh, societies where you've already uh, put up these charging points if there are any indication i'm sure uh, with this uh, expansion of your network will also have a direct you know positive impact on the uh, ev adoption rate in india as well uh yeah let me bring in uh, uh bounce infinity uh bounce infinity i mean uh, many of us uh, would be aware that they started off as a shared uh, mobility service and now evolved uh, uh, to becoming an oem as well as well as they offering uh, you know swapping uh, battery swapping services anil uh, tell us about your initial experience of you know, in, in this uh, in this new phase of being an oem as well as a, as a battery swapping service provider what, what are the key takeaways that you have uh, to share with us thank you so much is it to be a part of this panel um see i think for us uh, like you told we started off as a shared mobility company and uh, being an oem and building a battery infra came from our inherent need to set up the ev uh, set up the infra because uh, we didn't find the right form factor to run our business nor did we find the right infra to run this business and and commute is a such a uh, you know basic problem that we were solving uh it would it would only get solved by swapping as a, a, a solution so that's what, that's how we kind of forward into both working on building our own scooter which was suited for an indian use case uh as well as also build a navy infrastructure around swapping which can uh, which definitely powered uh, our our mobility business initially and now we are using the same infra to power our oem business as well as Uh, enable the same infra for other oems who would want to sell a bike with a uh, sell a bike or a noto without battery um, currently bounces into three uh, verticals one is shared mobility business which we will continue to scale and expand to multiple cities second being an oem where we sell vehicles uh, to customers electric vehicles to customers which they can use it for their personal use and third battery as a service which is laid down uh, as an infra to support these two use cases 
But in addition to this, we would also work with other OEMs to collaborate and uh, enable them to sell bikes with bikes or. So, so uh, this service is a brand agnostic. Yes, this is brand agnostic as of now. Um, it is not only for a bounce use case. We work with OEMs to integrate uh, the batteries uh, so that it is interoperable between our use case and their, their use case. So uh, to give you a situation, the same battery can be used for a shared mobility fleet. Uh, it can be used for a bounce infinity fleet and it can be used uh, by another OEM. Uh, either an, on an auto or a two-wheeler, depending upon the use case. And of course, as long as the form factor is the same, otherwise, you yes. can't. Yes, 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 you're right. You're okay, right. so here, uh, let me uh, uh, get in uh, Arun Shres Reddy, who is the founder of Race Energy. Arun, uh, uh, your, I mean, uh, what I want to understand from you, uh, one of the key highlights of this year's uh, uh, union budget was the FM mentioning about, um, you know, uh, a battery swapping policy, uh, which could be announced in, uh, in the in the near future. So, uh, what what are the key uh, uh, things you would like to see in that policy, which would really you know help uh, not only the better adoption rate of this technology, but generally it will help fuel the uh, Indian EV industry's growth significantly. Right. Uh, yeah. Firstly, thank you for having me here, uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, very uh, impressive to firstly hear about battery swapping being announced in the in the union budget. Right? I mean, uh, the journey that we've had over the past four to five years uh, from swapping being so uh, you know doubtful whether it would take off to eventually kind of hearing the government sort of having an intention to come up with the policy to sort of help boost the adoption of EVs through swapping. I think that itself was a great announcement that was like very delightful for us to hear. Uh, so in, 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 in general, I think, uh, broadly speaking, um, you know, two to three categories, how uh, the policy could help us uh, help the whole battery swapping ecosystem sort of take off and help in that EV adoption rate that is required, right? Uh, typically to start off with, I think uh, the, the the GST rate, right? So, so the since the fact that the battery is sold without the vehicle, uh, so the GST rate and, you know, how depending on the state to state, again, it's kind of in the gray area, um, you know, whether you would, would you charge a 5% or would you charge an 18%? And, and again, what happens to the float, uh, you know, the batteries that are kept in extra uh, in the pool for the swap to happen. Uh, so these batteries are typically always charged at 18 percent. Uh, so because of this, you know, uh, even even though the fact that the battery is the heart of an electric vehicle, uh, it is still being priced at an 18 percent GST rate. And uh, we expect and we hope the government to sort of bring that down to 5 percent. Uh, you know, great uh, boost uh, to the pricing of the battery itself, right? Straight away. So I think that is one thing uh, that we hope for to come out. Um, and also, you know, in terms of the incentives, uh, you know, sort of to uh, whatever the incentives that are being provided in the fame uh, to subsidy to sort of uh, be more clear and be more provide more clarity in the sense that how those would be applicable to a swapping platform right in a similar way as you know what is being put into the vehicles versus you know what's in the float uh, the subsidy sort of should uh, be uh, provided for these batteries in the float as well uh, so these are some things that you know we are looking forward to um, and I think in terms of, uh, you know, they've also come out with something in the sense of standardization as well. Uh, while from a customer-centric standpoint, it's a really great uh, concept. Uh, it is something that's, you know, uh, a technologically uh, a really hard uh, uh, system or a hard solution to sort of pull out. Um, in terms of deploying an interoperable standard, in terms of working with different chemistries, working with different uh, kinds of batteries inside a, a fixed form factor, sort of restricts um, you know um, the technological advancements that are happening, not just with the different chemistries that are coming up, but in terms of swapping as well. We're barely getting started. Uh, we're trying to get, uh, you know, we're reducing the volume year on year. And as I said, I think I mentioned this to you as well before. Uh, it sort of basically forces us to think inside the box uh, rather than sort of thinking outside okay. the box. You are saying that while a swapping policy is uh, uh, more than welcome, perhaps, and uh, as you mentioned, your suggestion about the GST kind of uh, no, uh, rationalization, but you're saying that interoperability, uh, the standardizing interoperability could be a challenge because of these various developments, technological development that are taking place. And therefore, right. that may not be a, such a good idea. Is that so? Yeah, that's absolutely correct because I think we're very, very nascent uh, in this industry. Uh, I mean, over the four years of development of our swappable battery cell, we've gone through so many changes. 
Um, you know, from where we started off with the battery pack, year on year, we've been able to reduce the volume by 50%. We've been increasing the energy density by 20% year on year. Uh, and we are today at the most energy dense bat swappable battery pack in the country. Uh, and we also want to push this by a good 20% right moving forward. So there's a lot of things that are there in the in the uh, you know swapping space that are still yet to be uh, discovered and you sort of invented and explored. Um, so by by defining a volume and by defining a sort of a fixed uh, barrier and even to the connectors as well, right? Very, very nascent. So I don't think of any uh, swap battery which has probably gone through 10,000 cycles of connectors you know, right so they're, they're very very early in that sense um, so uh, pushing uh, uh, interoperability policy this soon will definitely hinder uh, the development of the batteries uh, and the swapping ecosystem great so let me get another opinion there uh, in the same uh, on the same topic uh, uh, Pulkit Kurana co-founder of battery smart uh, and battery smart as I understand have already completed has already completed about 1 million swaps is that correct Pulkit yeah Thanks, Sumantra. Uh, yeah, I think we did 1 million around two months back. Uh, closer to 2 million now, we're growing at a very rapid pace. Uh, so what's your take on the uh, on what uh, no, Arun has shared? I mean, yes, uh, a battery shopping policy is more than welcome, but when it comes to interoperability uh, standards, perhaps uh, no, that may hinder uh, kind of no, the uh, prog uh, development of various technologies. Uh, so I totally agree with Arun, right? So it's a unanimous opinion. If you talk to any OEM or you talk to any swapping operator, it's it's not beneficial at this stage. It's a it's a very noble thought that uh, all batteries should have one standard. India should have one standard of battery across all swapping, but it's too early to do that. Uh, all of us are experimenting on the form factors, on the chemistries. Uh, OEMs have different form factors uh, in terms of the vehicle that that where the battery would fit in. Everyone is using different connectors as well. I think what makes sense is to set contours around what is accepted as a swappable battery. Maybe lay out that this should be the maximum size or this should be the minimum energy density, uh, lay out certain safety guidelines around it, and also provide subsidies and uh, GST at par, as, as Arun mentioned, right? That's a no-brainer. I mean, you have to create a level playing field uh, for swapping to take off. Uh, we should be able to avail similar uh, subsidies un under FAME, similar GST outputs for ourselves. But uh, uh, setting one standard would really kill the innovation, not just on the product side as well, but also from a consumer point, point of view, right? It would not leave any differentiation at that point. Uh, 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 it, it's only a few players, everyone just getting started, just scratching the surface. If you uh, mandate one standard at that point, essentially every user is going to get similar battery everywhere. Uh, there is no differentiation in terms of product quality, in terms of pricing, in terms of service quality. You're basically uh, killing the industry before, before it, it is born, right? And yes. I think uh, everyone has already shared those thoughts uh, with Niti Aayog. We had a consultation se session with them. Uh, most of the players from India were there. Uh, and it was a unanimous opinion. It's, it's up to Niti Aayog uh, from here to, to take it forward. And... Uh, in their draft note, they have recognized, I think they've recognized Bounce as well. They've recognized us as some of the, the key players who are driving this. And uh, I, I'm sure Bounce has also shared their opinion. Uh, and we also have put, put forward our thoughts. So we'll, we'll wait to see how, how this pans out. Uh, Sulaja, your take as an OEM, uh, in uh, this interoperability, the, the standardization of that, do you think that will also kind of, kind of no, perhaps restrain uh, certain uh, developments and therefore uh, no, have a, an un, uh, not so good impact uh, on the overall uh, no, growth of the EV industry? I think it's a double-edged sword if you ask me, because if you, uh, if you do not have any interoperability, right, then there are two things that may happen. One is that, um, you know, uh, either the OEMs, um, and again, when I say OEMs, I would mean the large OEMs with deep financial pockets will probably then tend to create their own closed loops, right? Saying that, okay, I am so-and-so and I'm going to create my own uh, X thousand uh, battery swapping stations by buying the equipment. I have the money and I don't want to rely on any outside uh, partners because what if they don't, you know, uh, they don't provide sustainability and my customers then will suffer, et cetera, et cetera. So then it again becomes a game where those who can create scale fast, right, will move. And it might also therefore hamper innovation and the startup ecosystem. This is one disadvantage of that. Uh, whereas if you have interoperability, then customers can choose, you know, which 
a swapping platform they want to participate nobody is controlling that swapping platform customers can choose um so if you don't have interoperability some of the larger players or oems or a large private equity fund own fund can actually create you know a, i would say a, exclusive a, network exclusive network right and that would hamper innovation and startup ecosystem and the second thing is that you know even for the customers right um then there is a little bit of lack of confidence uh, in going for swapping because they may have the doubt about what if this particular you know swapping uh, partner doesn't uh, uh, continue to be ex to to you know to work in my area uh, what if you know they don't have enough density um some of the smaller oems or, or will i will i get the same quality of battery that i would get uh, exchanged uh, for yeah same quality consistency reliability you know long term uh, uh, confidence in that network okay um, that becomes a bit of a question mark now on the other hand you know if you have so that's that's for interoperability to build customer confidence and also to build a level playing field for not just few large players but many players to come in with innovation because nobody can control right now if you don't have inter but if you have interoperability then as some of the players have mentioned uh, you know how do you still retain differentiation Oh. we as oems we have recommended to niti ayog in the same uh, forum that we should decide how to how to implement interoperability it should basically be according to us connectors can be standardized because that's kind of you no know, like charging right you need hmm. to standardizing the sockets and you know uh, uh, like your mobile phones maybe yeah it's not really a differentiation room for that much you know differentiating point and for the uh, the batteries you know like a a maximum size possible so if you have more efficient batteries you can have smaller batteries in the larger container so to speak right but the maximum size so you can standardize basically in a way that customers can move across the swapping platforms but each swapping provider or a battery provider could still come with better technology which will offer better pricing which will offer more efficiency so some kind of a golden mean to be found you know not saying that okay the battery should be 48 volt it should be this chemistry it should be exactly this but saying that okay up to this size up to this kind of a, you know um uh, form and factor um outer limit so to speak um we believe that could be a golden mean where there is interoperability but there's room for differentiation and um, as an oem i think we are actually more for interoperability because again as i said in the beginning we believe that this entire industry will grow through collaboration and not by having closed loop systems again then we'll go back to the same ice era where players you know with global scale are dominating the market because why shouldn't we evolve as a completely different tech based uh, industry you know with the new age kind of thought processes aggregation of charging uh, platforms for example somebody discussed so i think the more you have ability to collaborate a more collaboration will happen otherwise again we are going back to an era where uh, you know there will be few standard solutions and there will be more closed loop system so this is my thought process on it nil uh, your take on it because now you are both you are a, a battery swapping service provider as well as an oem i think you uh, know what sulaja is suggesting i think uh, that could be perhaps be the middle path uh, uh, do do you feel so too or do you think do you have a different view point i think uh, most of the panelists uh, share the same opinion uh, but if you ask me based on our interaction with niti ayog and the rest in the government the objective of making standardization uh, or bringing in standardization is to enable interoperability right that's the objective with which standardization is being uh, thought about um so directionally i think it is uh, in the right place uh, what what our request uh, and i'm sure everybody in the in the panel here and the rest of the players have requested niti ayog is to not specify something um you know very rigid right to give a range of sorts uh let's say in terms of the dimension or the connectors not to specify oh you mean to say that uh, you set the target the means to achieve the target leave it to the players yes and and then give a directional uh you know push uh like give a range of dimension give a range of connectors so directionally people move towards a particular technology and government i think do recognize the the fast pace at which the technology is evolving uh, they do understand that uh, specifying or standardizing standardizing a particular technology is not good for the overall uh, development of the of the uh, industry as such so uh, i think initial conversations uh, with the government the policy will most likely have a range of sorts defining 
and not specifying a particular technology. Uh, okay. I'm hoping that's how the policy will come up as well. I, th I think uh, I think uh, that's a very good suggestion, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm sure the uh, government will also take the feedback and will come up with a will design a policy which really kind of you know, uh, meets the true objective or the true need of the Indian industry, uh, and uh, I facilitate and also facilitate the growth of the market as well as enhancing and enabling uh, industry players to be uh, not only uh, get the scale but also to be of uh, you know international standards. Uh, Arun, uh, talking about swapping, uh, this, this whole uh, uh, emerging uh, no, uh, battery swapping business, the market, how big do you think it could uh, become in India? And also, if you can just uh, uh, kind of uh, compare it with, say, markets like uh, uh, Africa or similar markets, uh, markets similar to India, uh, no, what prospects do you see? And I believe, uh, Race Energy also has some uh, plans to go uh, uh, beyond the Indian market. Yeah, yeah, you know, that's absolutely correct. Uh, I think uh, that would definitely be the uh, end goal. Uh, but, you know, just to start off with the, the questions that you asked, uh, it is, it, it's, you know, the swapping generally typically works uh, when there's a requirement for, you know, heavy utilization of the vehicle, where there's, you know, standing idle and charging your vehicle is typically lost of revenue. So that's why it's seen a huge uh, uptick in terms of commercial vehicles like auto rickshaws, e-rickshaws, and two-wheelers as well. Um, you know, I think that's where also um, Anil and Bounce has started because the, the vehicle has to be, uh, you know, being on the roads as much as possible. Um, and then, of course, you have these, uh, you know, um, hybrid solutions in between. Again, a lot of people here on the panel are working in the sense that, you know, you have this charging and swapping with the, the fact that you can take the battery um, along with you and, you know, charge it at your home. And then, you know, you, can, you have the option of swapping uh, at any of the swapping stations as well. So this could typically work with, uh, you know, private users or commercial users who have who do not have access to proper charging infrastructure or at their home would like to have some flexibility in both the both the options. Right? And, then, and on the other um, complete end of the spectrum, uh, where, you know, Jyoti is working on is basically this good amount of, um, you know, ample amount of time for the vehicles to rest, you know, stay idle, either at your home or your office, uh, and typically follow some sort of fixed road. And the range of the vehicle being offered also is, is enough to do like, you know, three to four days worth of travel comfortably, right? So, uh, in the, so there's a whole wide spectrum in terms of where, you know, on one end you have charging that works brilliantly and on the other end, which is a commercial side is typically where swapping works really well. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it's it's the whole L3, the whole three-wheeler uh, segment, majority of it, up to even like 80% of the market uh, would typically move towards a swapping solution moving forward and then, you know, the around 15, 20%, you know, having been to a lot of these auto rickshaw drivers' houses myself, uh, having spoken to four to 500 drivers, and that's the, the basic understanding that we have that, you know, uh, the, the split would be somewhere in between, 20% uh, 20, 20 split to a charging and 80% sort of split to swapping and some hybrid system. Um, and so I, think, I think, I think a similar use case. And then the two wheeler segment, what is your, uh, no, kind of uh, so to be honest, I think Anil would be a better person to give that answer in terms of the market split. Uh, but I think uh, uh, probably on the opposite side, I mean, the, the numbers would be reversed here. I think maybe 20% in, in swapping and 80% in, in charging. But again, Anil would be a better person to answer that question. Um, in, I'll just answer the second question and then, you know, you can ask this question to Anil, right? I think in terms of the markets, uh, we've seen, I mean, India is the largest manufacturer of auto rickshaws in the world, right? I mean, and, and most of these auto rickshaws are about typically pre-COVID era, 40-50% of the market, uh, you know, used to be export market, right? The production typically between 900,000 to 1 million units if we would manufacture, about 400 to 300,000 would be exported. Uh, and these would generally land up in Africa, or uh, sometimes in Southeast Asia, and sometimes in, in, in you know Latin American countries as well. Um, and what we've seen there is that uh, even with the sort of you know um, uh, in, in in Africa especially, right? Uh, uh, the, the the petrol and the diesel over there is not up to the trade standards. Uh, electricity is also quite cheap over there. Uh, power availability is very cheap, so it makes perfect sense for uh, an electric vehicle, be it charging or swapping, right? To, to sort of get there and, and you know. Um, uh, deploy the solutions over there because um, because of these particular reasons. Um, and our retrofit solutions also work out really well over there because the engines and the powertrains don't quite last well, uh, similar to Indian market because of the, uh, you know, the, the quality of the fuel not being so great. 
Um, and for that reason, you know, just plucking out the engine and um, refurbishing it with like a completely new electric power, power train uh, makes perfect sense with this these kind of markets. Okay, I see. And uh, uh, Jyoti, uh, talking about the uh, charging, as as uh, uh, Arun was saying, the the mix of let's say vehicles in terms of fixed batteries, with, uh, which will depend on charging infrastructure and operable. So, uh, how do you see the market evolving? You know, because uh, your businesses also will also be, you know, kind of uh, to a great extent influenced by the mix of vehicles, unless you also plan to get into battery swapping. Is there uh, a plan there? Uh, no. So, uh, like, uh, we have another business vertical, but that's on the smart mobility, like what, uh, let's say, Ola or Ether offer in their bike. So, we uh, offer those technologies to the OEMs and fleets. Uh, so that's another line of business, but that's not uh, related to the battery solving technology. Uh, so our technologies essentially at Bolt are built for the end consumers, essentially. I think commercial is something which is seeing a takeoff right now. And uh, I think uh, swapping makes a lot of sense there also. Uh, but if you look at consumer mindset, like uh, for me, I have EVs, like I have bought almost all of the EVs, at least for R&D purposes. Uh, generally, uh, we don't uh, want to kind of have the battery swapped or something as an end consumer uh, perspective, because the thing is, uh, you are paying lump sum amount for the entire uh, uh, vehicle, whether it is a two wheeler or a four wheeler. And uh, I wanted to basically uh, be parked at my place. Uh, uh, and probably I only share with only my friends and family, my vehicle, right? Uh, so it's it's more of a personal asset also, right? Um, uh, so the thing is, uh, for the end users, when we look at it, we think uh, uh, like charging at their own homes would be like 80-90% of the uh, market and which is what uh, we are also going after essentially. Right? Okay. Um, uh, you, you expect 80-90% of the end users, especially yeah. two-wheelers, to use yeah. their fixed uh, uh, charging uh, at their home. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ulkit, uh, you you uh, work with uh, no, uh, partners. Uh, your business model, while you are also a battery swapping service provider uh, like Race Energy, but your business model is different. So, uh, how do you plan to progress in this in terms of co-development of uh, no, uh, new technologies and uh, uh, no, uh, bringing out new solutions? Uh, what is the roadmap? Right. So uh, we, we like to think ourselves as a swapping network operator, right? So our core competencies are in asset utilization. Essentially, every battery should get swapped as soon as it is charged. A customer should have zero wait time when they arrive at a swap station, right? So when we are trying to do that, as a lot of analysts said, it is uh, imperative that we have a collaborative approach because we are trying to become that de facto fuel station for EVs, right? Uh, and when we are doing that, we have to take a very open approach. We cannot bind ourselves with one OEM in terms of uh, an exclusive customer. We cannot bind ourselves to one uh, manufacturer of batteries either, right? What we have tried to do is uh, take a take our own standard approach in terms of battery. So we, we do deploy one form factor and one specification of battery on the network, but we already serve 120 plus variants uh, from an OEM perspective, right? So we are not a closed loop network in any sense. We are trying to be that open uh, network where any OEM can plug and play. Uh, also in terms of interoperability, we have achieved that interoperability within the network. In As in the same batteries power a two-wheeler, the same batteries power a e-rickshaw, the same batteries power a L5 vehicle. So that is also interoperability. So interoperability is not just between networks, but also between vehicles. So we are trying to do that. And that is why a collaborative approach was important for us. Uh, we are backing on various large battery manufacturers on working towards the technology improvement, giving our inputs because we have a large touch base of customers. We serve more than 4,000 customers every day. So based on those learnings, we keep giving inputs on the design and improvements on the battery, but we are not doing that hardware ourselves. Right. And that has made us a, a lot asset light and does have been able to scale at this pace in a very short span of time, uh, because uh, we are only doing one thing, uh, which is setting up a network which can be utilized. It is accessible to people and at, and at an affordable price to, to do a swap. Uh, typically, customers pay us less than one rupee per kilometer, including the cost of battery. Right. So even the battery is provided by us. So uh, that is what our approach has been.
And, uh, I mean, uh, when it comes to battery swapping, of course, uh, the segments of two wheelers and three wheelers are the most uh, no, strongest candidates. But elsewhere, uh, uh, overseas, there are also examples of you know, uh, cars, uh, passenger vehicles, and of course, in India also, there was there were pilot projects which were which were uh, done for uh, buses for battery swapping. Do you, do you expect these segments also to kind of become uh, kind of no? Uh, bigger uh, when it comes to battery swapping? Or do you think uh, no, perhaps you know, two and three wheelers, because of the scale of India, two and three wheelers will be the main mainstay for uh, battery swapping services? So at least in the short run, we think two wheelers and three wheelers will be the scale. So 80 million two wheelers and three wheelers are expected to be on road, uh, which would be electric in the next three to four years. India, India has 200 million uh, two wheelers and uh, we are the largest three wheeler market in the world. So obviously the volumes will come from there. There's already price parity in terms of total cost of ownership uh, on the back of the subsidies available. Uh, cars are still picking up and cars is, swapping in cars is a very different technology. You need a robotic arm, you need to do it under belly swapping. We would definitely want to bring that to India, but we don't think that the volumes are at a scale where that kind of investment is warranted today. Uh, but as it grows and as the volume of cars grow, we would definitely want to do swapping for cars as well. Uh, but I think it is at least two to three years away from, from now. Uh, it's happening well in China and West, as you said, right? Yes, yeah. yes. and, and in, in these times, uh, you never know, it's very difficult to predict, to predict the future. Uh, no? right. and, uh, and as you said, perhaps no, uh, the cars could be the next uh, big segment. But uh, on that uh, note, we have just... Uh, uh, about a couple of minutes left for this session. Uh, uh, one round of last words from each one of you, uh, starting with Sulaja. Uh, your take on uh, the, let's say, if you take, take a horizon of, we are in 2022, say by 2030, uh, how big uh, a segment do you do see for uh, uh, for the two and three wheelers, uh, electric, uh, I'm, of course, we are talking about, since those are the segments that you uh, know of uh, play in. So, well, I would just say that we are at a very interesting time uh, in the whole EV sectors, you know, emergence in India and certainly at an inflection point. So two years ago, people were wondering if EV will be the future, you know, I think today that topic has been put to rest. Certainly the EV train has left the station. It's only a question of how fast, not if, you know, how quickly. Um, and I'm very bullish about electrification of two and three wheeler segments. Uh, with or without subsidy. I think subsidy is a short-term support, but there is going to be so much innovation that, you know, EVs are going to make a lot of sense for customers um, through different business models and technology over the years. So I think that for two-wheelers, um, the number of 10% uh, by 2025 is very conservative. It could be more. And the number of uh, around 50% by 2030 is what I would say. And that's because uh, there is a large motorcycle segment out there. So as far as scooters and mopeds go, I think they will go electric much faster, which are mostly you know, shorter distance commuting, uh, urban commuting or small town commuting. Motorcycles may take a little longer because then you have the rural to urban commute and you have the performance bikes, you know, where a lot more innovation has to come. But 50% by 2030 is a very conservative number according to me, and that's a huge number. India market will be around you know, four crores, uh, two wheelers by then. So it's, it's a large number we're looking at. Um, as far as three-wheeler goes, uh, three-wheelers go, I think uh, it will be a faster penetration, especially for uh, L3, of course, anyway, is almost all electric, uh, cycle rickshaws moving to e-rickshaws. And L5 also will go electric, maybe around 70% can be electric uh, by 2030. It's the rural, again, you know, the rural connectivity from the bus depot to the villages where people are using the large format sharing kind of diesel vehicles, you know, which might be the last leg. But again, the urban centers, I don't see why anybody should use a diesel vehicle uh, when electric vehicles with different formats will be available and uh, providing a much lower cost of operation. So I'm very bullish on the prospects in the next 10 years. It's going to be a very exciting time. And again, it will create a lot of opportunities uh, for many new entrepreneurs to come in many new areas uh, of the EV ecosystem. And I want to wish them all the very best. And I would again leave them with the mantra of collaboration and working together uh, to take electric vehicle as a cost forward faster. So all the best to everyone. Uh, on that note, uh, now let me get, get the voices of the uh, you know, startup club, if I may call them. And uh, and as I said, in this age of collaboration, uh, doesn't matter how uh, the age doesn't matter. 
even a startup uh, with maybe a barely a year or two year old may may kind of now there are examples of uh, not striking uh, collaboration with uh, no uh, well established companies some of whom are also referred to as legacy companies so starting with you uh, uh, arun now your uh, outlook for the uh, uh, indian ev industry now in the in the time period of uh, say you know now uh, between now and 2030 Yeah, I think uh, you know I uh, completely agree with Sujaya over there in terms of the numbers that she uh, presented, and I think yeah, in in certain sense, uh, hopefully that's conservative, and I think we, uh, there's definitely capacity to pull that off much much deeper penetration in terms of the uh, percentage of, of the vehicles that are being converted to electric, and especially with the uh, three wheelers and L5 segments also uh, very bullish, and uh, we're seeing. uh great uh cost parity in the sense that you know the operational cost uh the cost of uh, uh converting or you know adopting an electric vehicle up front has also come down now with uh, swapping uh, much much lower than uh, buying a new ice ice engine vehicle and at the same time providing a you know per kilometer cost much cheaper than um, diesel or petrol and even even cheaper than cng in certain instances right uh, so that kind of cost reduction and uh, cost comparison uh, although you know we always knew that the total cost of ownership was uh, always lower for an electric vehicle but uh, giving on a per kilometer and per energy basis through swapping uh, through like uh, to these guys uh, you know they always live on a day to day basis and then they now can see that it's much much are uh, cheaper to utilize that so we've already reached that uh, 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 you know situation where we are you know cheaper and the drivers are realizing it's it's, it's uh, cheaper to use an electric vehicle um so i think uh, you know the this from now on it's 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 all about how fast we can bring in the scale um how fast we can go from uh, manufacturing 100 vehicles a month to doing a 10000 vehicles a month kind of a number uh, and you know again uh, this can be definitely uh, be fast track uh, through subsidies through support from the government through collaboration the sir has mentioned um and and it's all about you know uh, it, it if if we can if we can achieve something like a 10000 per month kind of a number in multiple startups of oems i think uh, at least uh, rolling out a good 90% um uh, you know sales happening as electric vehicles can happen within the next 5 to 7 years itself uh, and then the population can from there on yeah can be converted to commercial Okay. Thank you, there, uh, Arun. Uh, Anil, see if you look at the horizon of 2030 of, of your three business verticals, uh, which one? Uh, how do you see them in terms of your contribution to the overall uh, no, uh, business of bonds? I think they are all in the space of EV, uh, and I'm sure they're all prosper. I think uh, EV is definitely going to happen. Uh, like like the rest of the panel said, uh, told it's just a matter of time. Uh, it is definitely going to happen. um see i think fundamentally if you see uh, at, at a, as a user they would choose uh, any of this uh, solution uh, as a mode of commute and which is very very basic for any of us um uh, and whichever solution offers them the most uh, reliable and the cheapest uh, are the ones that will get adopted at scale and right. that has happened uh, traditionally as well um and 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 eb is that solution right now with uh, so much uh, happening around the fuel prices and uh and them only going up um ev definitely is a is the right solution and i think the ecosystem has uh, emerged in the right time with the right technology in place uh swapping charging i think both of them will prosper each of us have uh, our own uh, thoughts around what will work but i think it will it will evolve both of them will evolve um but ev adoption i think will definitely happen by 2030 uh, like at least i am very bullish right now in india we sell close to about 16 to 18 million vehicles a year uh, i'm guessing at least 80% of them uh, especially on the two wheeler and three wheeler segment uh, will be ev uh, and i'm also quite bullish on the on on the four wheeler space uh, mainly because of the cost at which the fuel prices are increasing the rate at which the fuel prices are increasing so could it be that bounce and enters the four wheeler space also by then by 2030 <laughs> yeah hopefully you never know <laughs> Okay, I never know. Uh, uh, Pulkit, uh, your take on no, the overall composition and uh, no, the share of uh, sw- uh, sw- uh, swappable batteries and fixed batteries, let's say. So um, I think China was able to completely do uh, electrification of two wheelers within five years, right? So just to take that perspective, I think eight years is a very long time, and it is al- always very difficult to visualize or internalize a exponential 
growth when it happens and we have already crossed that inflection point so it could everyone is is right in that sense i mean and we we might look back and say we were too conservative and it was all electric in 2030 even that is a possibility so i think 8 years is a very long time and uh, definitely two wheeler and three wheeler space uh, there is a possibility it could be all electric by 2030 uh last but not least jyoti uh, the charging infrastructure the very crucial uh, kind of piece of the whole uh, no puzzle uh, so uh, how big a network do you think no india india would have let's say okay uh, become, uh, 2030 is long time but uh, let's say by 2025 or so and uh, so, do you plan to then by then get into some adjacent spaces also uh uh maybe we'll see uh, but the thing is uh, uh, uh i think with every ev sold there will be some charging point which will be installed or some swapping station which has to be installed right uh, so uh, like if you're looking at a total number of vehicle of let's say um, 2 million to 3 million every year which is 80% as what uh, i would also say uh, in terms of adoption then we would have already like about uh, i i suppose about uh, 10 to 20 million uh, evs running on the road uh, in the next few years itself i think every ev will need a charging point and you need to basically build that out so probably millions of charging points across india in the next few oh, years it's a good good business potential for someone like bolt all as well there right so <laughs> yeah thank you on that note uh, I'm, i'm we have just uh, not kind of run out of time and uh, thank you very much uh, uh, sulaja arun uh, anil jyoti and pulkit for sharing your very uh, uh, valuable insights your your interesting viewpoints as well as some very very interesting uh, not uh, very pertinent and very valuable uh, kind of thoughts uh, which will also serve as maybe inputs uh, especially when it comes to uh, policy uh, designing especially around battery swapping and interoperability so uh, thank you very much uh, i absolutely enjoyed conducting this discussion and i'm sure all the attendees would also agree with me that it was a very very fruitful and enriching discussion on that note thank you very much once again everyone and wishing you all the very best